We need to uh, get right into it as we're not going to get out of here by 2 o'clock as advertised. So we're going to jump right in. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come to the Word today that you would bear us along by the Holy Spirit who inspired it, that you would bear us along as you bore the prophets of old along as a sailing ship is borne along before the wind. I pray that you would edit at my mouth and at the listeners' ears and that you would show us Jesus Christ in what is brought from your Word today. We ask in His name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm really going to begin today in uh, 1 John. And uh, during the period of time in which you are uh, seeking a new pastor and, and all of that, if I'm with you any other time, we're going to jump right back in where we left it today. I'm going to practice the bailout school of homiletics. When one of you falls down out of the pew, I'm bailing out. <laughs> okay, and that'll be, that will be the, uh, the end of the sermon for today. <clears throat> The Apostle John wrote five books of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, 1, 2, th and 3 John, and by the way, that's okay depending on where you are. I know that a presidential candidate who shall remain unnamed talked about two Corinthians back down the road in this uh, presidential year, and everybody went, oh, ho, 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 how, how ignorant that is. He ought to know that it's 2 Corinthians and so on. Listen. If you listen to the Scottish preachers, if you listen to the English preachers, if you listen to the European preachers, Alistair Begg, Sinclair Ferguson, John Monroe, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, you will see that they all say 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and uh, I understand. We say 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, I have no illusions. I do not suppose at all that the presidential candidate was actually familiar with 2nd or 2 Corinthians, whichever, but uh, I just thought I'd lay that one on you, all right? So five books John wrote, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Revelation. All of them are in many ways different from the Gospels in particular. We have in the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, which begins with the genealogy of Jesus, written to people who were Jews, written to people who were, to whom he was demonstrating by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was the God, of, the Messiah of God, who indeed had come and was the descendant of David. So it begins with the genealogy of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark begins right away with the uh, ministry of John the Baptist and then goes right through the ministry of Jesus to his death, burial, and resurrection. The Gospel of Luke <clears throat> begins with the birth of John the Baptist, and then finally of Jesus, and then goes right through to the end, to his birth, death, and resurrection. The question is, but John does not. John starts a whole different way. I'm going to read the first four verses of 1 John this morning, and, <clears throat> and then we'll look at some of these other things. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our or your joy may be complete, depending on the manuscript. The Gospel of John, <clears throat> I'll get there. The Gospel of John begins in a similar way. You're probably familiar with these words. <clears throat> "'In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God.' He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then he talks about John, but down in verse 14 he says, And this Word, this Word through whom the universe was created, became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then at the end of that section, verse 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God, got that? No one has ever seen God. The only God who became flesh, the Word, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. All of that is quite different from the way the other so-called synoptic gospels begin. And John's letters, 1 John, which we will be in <coughs> eventually, 1 John, which we will be in, begins in a similar way. And so here, here are the things that John has in mind. He has four things that he wants his hearers or his readers to know. And these four things were not the same things that were present way back in the beginning at the end of Jesus' ministry, at His death, His burial, and His resurrection. The audience has changed, as we'll see. <clears throat> he wanted them to know this, and these are themes that run through all of John's writing, even the prophetic book of the Revelation. One, he wanted them to know that he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. In biblical Christianity, when we say apostle, I understand. On the horizon today, there are apostle this, apostle that, apostle the other thing. Even people that claim to be apostles, that's a whole movement that's beginning uh, in different places. But when we say apostle in biblical Christianity, we're talking about the 12 that Jesus chose, less Judas, plus one that was chosen to take his place, and their principal, uh, their principal claim to credibility is that they were eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. Now, they were not the only eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. There were others, up to 500, Paul says, but they were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord. And John wants the people to whom he's writing to know that he was that eyewitness. Okay? Secondly, he wants them to know about the truth of the deity and the humanity of the Lord. When God climbed into human flesh, that person that came as a result of that was 100% God and 100% man. 100% plus 100% adds up to 100% God-man a totally unique individual that ever had come on the scene. He wasn't part God and part man. That would have begun to reflect on, on uh, the Greek mythology of the day. So John wanted them to know, for you theologians, about the so-called hypostatic union, the meeting of God and man in one individual, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, John has quite a bit to say about the perversion of Christian liberty, which identifies false believers. Don't know that we'll get there today, but we will one day, all right? And finally, he wants them to know the necessity of love among the brethren. I notice in this church, there's a great deal of talk about how we love each other and the fellowship is sweet, and it is, and you do. Okay, but John is called the apostle of love, and it is he that emphasizes that the believers are to love one another. Little children love one another. If we get into taking all of this apart verse by verse, we'll see that over and over again. So, why are these the themes of John's books and not so much the themes of some of the others? All right, here's why. Because there is a time change and there is an audience change. And you say, how'd that come about? Well, Jesus, John met Jesus when he was about 18 or 20 years old. He was just a teenager. And by the way, he was not the teenager of love when he met Jesus. In fact, Jesus nicknamed he and his brother James the sons of thunder. <clears throat> okay, so that's not exactly what you call the apostle of love, and we'll look at that perhaps down the road. And then Jesus is crucified, buried, he rises again. You remember the familiar passage in John chapter 20 where Peter and John have a race to the tomb, and uh, John beats Peter to the tomb. Why? Because he's a teenager, 
All right, when I was uh, 25, I would challenge teenagers to run. When I was 30, a little less. When I was 40, nah. <clears throat> and now, not at all, okay? So John was a young man. James and John were young men at the time they met Jesus. And they were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. <clears throat> but here's what happened. The church is formed at Jerusalem. We are in our Bible study. Where we have been reading about the uh, events of Pentecost and the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost and all of that. The church is formed. It basically stays in Jerusalem. Then persecution breaks out. Some of them move to Antioch of Syria. But in 70 AD, the Romans come into Jerusalem. They destroy the temple in fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, even taking apart every stone. You remember what Jesus prophesied? Every stone is going to be laid down. Why? They thought there was gold in, in, the, uh, in between the stones, and the Romans took it all down, right down to the base, what is called the Wailing Wall, the foundation, the Wailing Wall today in Jerusalem. When the Romans came into Jerusalem and destroyed it in 70 AD, the Christians fled north, and they fled to what is now Turkey, what the, what the New Testament calls Asia, which we have called in our geography Asia Minor, okay, and there the center of, that begins to be the center of action. And the church that is there, that is the center of activity, is the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was the premier city of that, time, of that, uh, of that area of Asia. It was a seaport town. It was a large city. Also, by the time the Christians flee in A.D. 70 to go north, all of the apostles have been martyred, except one, the apostle John. John flees north with them. He sets up in Ephesus, and John oversees, until the end of his life, John oversees the churches of Asia Minor. They are named in the book of Revelation. And if you want to get your map out, by the way, and look at those churches in order, the first message is to the church at Ephesus. That's where things begin. And then you follow the major trade route that goes northwest uh, from Ephesus, and you will see each of those churches. So the churches in Revelation are named because they, are, they would be the order in which the letters from the Lord Jesus to those churches were delivered. <clears throat> okay? So now here's the deal. John meets Jesus when he's 20 or so. Fast forward 60 years. Now he's in his 80s. He is the last living apostle. Can you not imagine that at Ephesus and at Laodicea, and at Hierapolis, and at Colossae, and all of those churches composed of people that had never seen Jesus. They were like us. That's why this is important. They were like us. We've never seen Jesus. We are not Jews. We are Gentiles. So were these people in Asia. There were Jews there, to be sure, but it was a large Gentile population. And now here we have the last living apostle John. You can imagine that the people in those churches wanted John to rehearse one more time the events of the life of Jesus. But at the same time that all of this was going on, it wasn't just a sentimental, how about a rehearsal of the life of Jesus for us, John, since you're about to pass off the scene. There are other things that have begun to happen in the meantime. And here is a place of caution for us. As we consider this, I'll take my watch off. That always relieves some people. It actually, it actually doesn't work, but, but it's okay. <laughs> All right. There were other things that had begun. There were other things that had begun to go on during that time. And the warning for us is this: We are all born into a culture that has a world view. All of us, and it is difficult to shake that worldview and to shake that culture and to adopt the worldview of the Scriptures. And we are all affected by that. I want to tell you that I pray often that the Lord will deliver me from the 
from being affected by the culture into which I was born. You say, what culture were you born into? The same one you were born into. And the basic worldview of the culture that you and I were born into is called modernism and materialism. I'm not talking about, I got another car, I got a bigger toaster, a better blender, and all that. I'm not talking about that kind of materialism. I'm talking about the idea that everything is reduced to atoms and molecules and exchanges of energy between them. You know, I used to teach chemistry and physics. I know all about that stuff. Okay, and many people in our culture and, and our people speak and think as if everything is random and everything just sort of operates and it just is and you can reduce everything to atoms and molecules. Let me tell you what, guys, if you go home to tell your wife that you love her but it's only a small chemical reaction, you're going to be in some trouble. In, we will be in deep weeds if we do not abandon the idea that everything reduces to atoms and molecules. That's the culture that we've been born into. What does that affect? It affects our view of the providence of God. It affects our view of the acts of God. It affects our view of, of the, uh, the very sovereignty and power of God. What do the scriptures say that goes absolutely against Everything that we have been born into. The scriptures say by him, by Jesus, all things consist. It says he upholds the universe. Hebrews chapter 1, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Which is to say this, that right now, God is superintending the activity of every atom and molecule in your body. And if he ceases that superintendence, you and I disappear in pink vapor or something because he holds it all together. That's why it's so preposterous that people, that people audit God. You know, God says, look, I, in order for you to exist, uh, I, we have gravity. In order for you to exist, we have all the chemistry, the stoichiometry works right. The atoms and molecules work right. We don't know why the nucleus of the atoms hold together. They, uh, it ought to fly apart because they're all positively charged. You physics students will get that. Okay. And, and so by me, all things hold together. By my power, the whole universe continues on. And we go, no, that's not what our kids are taught in school. Our kids are taught in school that the way the DNA works, for example, is it's all random. And these DNA strands, they just, they get together at random, and that's what produces you and me. That is what the Bible says. The Bible says, before you were conceived in the womb, I knew you. Your days were in my book before you ever were thought of. That's what the Bible says. And we are immersed in a, in a culture which says that, uh, no, these things are all random. These people in Asia Minor were immersed in something, too. We'll talk about it in a minute. Furthermore, now, of course, we're in postmodernism. In postmodernism, we say there is no such thing as absolute truth, and that is absolutely the truth. Okay, you understand the idiocy of that view. Do you not? Nevertheless, that is what shapes, that is what shapes our culture. That's where all this political correctness has come from. There is no absolute truth. How dare you make an evaluation of what I do, who I am, what I am, and all of that? That is not, that is not part of the biblical worldview. And if your greatest good this morning, if you're thinking in your insides, the greatest good that anyone can do is to be tolerant of anyone, anything, and so on. You are not thinking biblically. You are thinking like our culture. That's why the scriptures say, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, there is a book full of renewing of your mind out of which I'm preaching this morning. Okay? In any case, what had happened to these people was <clears throat> they, were, they, they were caught in Platonic dualism. You go, oh, great, Platonic dualism. That simply means this. That means that uh, following Plato, 
the Greek philosophers of the day, at least a great many of them, and the culture of the day, you remember that the that Greek was the culture, the trade culture of the whole Roman Empire, even though the Romans were in charge. Everything that is physical, Plato thought, probably is essentially evil. Everything that is spiritual, that is, that which cannot be seen, the invisible part of us, and all of that, that's essentially good. So all that is material is essentially evil, and I'm going fast here, all right? And all that is, and all that is spiritual, that is good. Now you see where this is going, do you not? The Bible says Jesus, God, God is a spirit. They that worship Him, worship Him in spirit and in truth, right? John 4, 24. God climbed into human flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, now wait a minute. If everything material is evil, how could a holy God who is perfectly good, how could a holy God climb into evil flesh and come and live among people? And so what had begun to grow up in the 50 years since John first met Jesus, or the 60 years since John first met Jesus, what had begun to grow up was this idea. Well, it has two ends. One end of the idea is that Jesus is not God. Does that sound familiar to you 2,000 years later, that Jesus is not God? Our culture does not want Jesus to be God. Our culture wants Him to be a good guy, a great teacher, a great example, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but they do not want Him to be God because to God we are accountable. And already by the end of the first century, 60 years after John met Jesus, already that was going on. The other end of it was called docetism. Don't worry about that. Don't put it in your notes. All right. The other end of that was this. The other end of that was Jesus wasn't physical at all. Not at all. Jesus was an apparition. These people that call themselves apostles, they didn't really see a physical Jesus. They saw an apparition. He was just a spirit. And, and, and there was a Jesus, all right, but uh, he went and was baptized by John, but then the God Spirit came on him, and then when he got mixed up in this Messiah complex and ended up at the cross, then the God Spirit left him, and so on. When John writes his books, all of them, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Revelation, that is a major thing that he is disputing. No, sir. The 100% God, the holy God, climbed into human flesh. He was the 100% God man, and he lived a life of holiness and died a death he did not deserve in order that people might be saved. That already was being attacked by the end of the first century. <clears throat> so John wanted them to know at least these two things, and that's probably as far as we're going to get today, that he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord, okay, and that, <clears throat> and that the, the truth of the matter about Jesus is that He is both deity and humanity in one individual, a unique individual that the world has never seen before. It is deceptive to be overcome by the culture into which you were born, these Asians that John wrote to, and the churches in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus and the churches of Asia Minor, which are the subject of Revelation, and of, and of letters like the letter to, of Paul to the Colossians, <clears throat> and, the Laodice, and the Laodiceans mentioned in Revelation. Those are all churches of Asia Minor, all right? People that had never seen the Lord, and they were, they were caught in their culture. And when people came along and said, you know, this Jesus that you say is your Savior, this Jesus is not God, how could He be your Savior? And John, and John rebelled against that big, big time. Now let's look at this business about the eyewitnesses for just a moment. In Acts chapter 2, we have Peter, when the Holy Spirit falls on the church in Acts chapter 2, we have Peter get up, and he basically preaches this. 
because he's preaching to people who were there 50 days earlier from the time he gave his sermon, 50 days earlier. He's preaching to those people, and, and some of them were there at Passover when Jesus was crucified, and he says to them, you, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ, and you, by the hands of evil men, have crucified him. And, and, but God raised him from the dead, and of this we are eyewitnesses. I'm not going to turn to Acts chapter 2 uh, today for time's sake. Aren't you glad? Okay, for time's sake, <clears throat> in order to rehearse all of that. But we are eyewitnesses of that. And then we come to Acts chapter 3, where the lame man is healed. And Peter says the same thing to the people that gather, and this guy's 40 years old, and, he, and, and Peter heals him. Okay, and he says this is done by faith in Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the Messiah, and he says he was crucified, and he was crucified by you, but he was resurrected from the dead, and of that we are eyewitnesses. Then they're hauled before the council in Acts chapter 4, and the council says, don't you preach in this guy's name anymore, because you know what? By this time, there were 8,000 believers that had come to Christ in Jerusalem in not very long, in just a few days, really. And so the powers that be were nervous about all of this. Don't you preach in the name of this guy anymore. And they say, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, we cannot help but preach in that name. Now, I want you to just notice this about that testimony of them being the eyewitnesses. It's fairly broad. We are the eyewitnesses. We saw him. We heard him. Fast forward 60 years to an audience of people that had never seen him, to an audience of people that had never been privy to the things that went on in Jerusalem at that time. And then we can, that brings us, doesn't it, to the beginning of 1 John, which I read to you previously. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, Okay, that's not different than what Peter said. Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. Got it? John says, look, to these people. John's an old man now, and he's writing to these people. And he's saying, look, <clears throat> we have seen him with our eyes. We have heard him with our ears. We have touched him with our hands. Now, the others that talk about being eyewitnesses don't talk about touching Jesus. Do you understand that when he's in a philosophic atmosphere of people saying, this Jesus couldn't possibly have actually been a man. He was just an apparition. He was just something that these people saw, as, as, uh, the, and the guy that was promulgating this was a guy named Serenthus, okay? But it was sweeping over all of the then known world. So John says, yeah, we touched him. We not only saw him, we not only heard him, we touched him. Did they? Yes, they did, didn't they? Thomas, I'll never believe, unless I stick my finger in his hands, put my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Okay, Thomas, here's my hand, stick your finger in. Okay, Thomas, here's my side. Put your hand in, my Lord and my God. Thomas touched him. Was he an apparition? No. Hey, boys, see so you're out there fishing. I prepared breakfast here on the beach. Come on in and have breakfast with me. Did they have breakfast with an apparition? No, they had breakfast with a resurrected human being. The old, the old Scottish theologians say, there's a man in the heavens now, and they're talking about the resurrected Christ who is in heaven and who has that resurrection body that we will have. John's going to talk about that. When we see him, we shall be as he is, he says. We'll get there one day. All right? And so it's important that, that John communicates to these people, hey, I was an eyewitness of the whole deal. We heard him. We saw him. We touched him. And that's important. You say, is that important to you? You know, we're 2,000 years later. Is that important to us? You bet it's important to us. You have believed in Jesus Christ on the testimony of the apostles. 
not on the testimony of some guy that said, I had a vision and I read some golden plates and my friend was on the other side of a blanket and he copied down what I said was on the golden plates and all of that stuff. Not, a, not on a sixth century Arab that said, well, you know, Allah has told me all of these things to write and to do and all of that. No, 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 no. We have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of the testimony of people that heard him, that saw him, that touched him in his resurrected body. That's why we have believed. Now there's a book called Cold Case Christianity. You might want to look it up on Amazon or something. And, and it is an examination of the testimony of these eyewitnesses. And the guy that wrote the book is an LAPD, a Los Angeles Police Department officer. His specialty is cold cases. You go back 40 years, all of the witnesses are dead, you have only the documents, you have only the statements that were given, and so you evaluate what happened on the basis of those things. That guy was an atheist when he began to look at the New Testament and evaluate the testimony of the eyewitnesses. Today he is a believer because the testimony of the eyewitnesses is true. And you and I have believed on the basis of that testimony. Now, is it important, is it important that the Lord Jesus Christ was both God and man? It's critically important. <clears throat> Let me go to 1 John chapter 4, and I'm going to close with this. I told you I was going to practice the bailout school of homiletics, and I'm going to. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are, wh whether they are from God. These people had said Jesus was just an apparition, the Serenthus, the Serenthuses of that time. They were saying he was just a spirit, no body, just a spirit. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, John ended up one day in a building with Serenthus, was a big auditorium. And uh, one of the church fathers writes about this. And John realizing that, Sir, if you don't think this is important, John realizing that Serenthus, Serenthus who said, Jesus is only a spirit, no body, okay? was in that same building, John cried out, he's an old guy now, you know, us old guys, we can get away with a lot of things, all right, okay. And John cried out in the midst of all that was going on in this, get out of here, flee, flee, for the building may come down. Serenthus the heretic is here. Okay, it was important to John, and it's important to us for this reason. By this, many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. You want to know the Spirit of God this morning? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus in the flesh is not from God. I added that second in the flesh. It's there by context. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. This is Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. You remember that worldview thing? It's easy to get caught up in the culture into which you were born, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, listens to the apostles' teaching. That's the testimony on the day of Pentecost, isn't it? The 3,000 believers who became, a large part of whom became that church in Jerusalem, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Fast forward 60 years, John the Apostle writing to these Asians is saying, in essence, you continue in the apostles' doctrine, which includes that God climbed into human flesh to become the 100% God-man. That's the only way that he could be your Savior. It was important to John. It's important to us. It's important to us. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. <clears throat> How can you know the spirit of God? It's got to speak according to the, <clears throat> to the doctrine of the apostles, which is found here in the New Testament. 
any deviation from that is not from God. In fact, John goes further. It is Antichrist. It's not just a little thing. It is Antichrist. You say, well, what about all these people? There's, there are people on the horizon now that are claiming that they're apostles. Okay, what about them? You know, maybe they are getting messages from God. You won't match that up with the book. And it's not only just a deviation, it's not only just heterodoxy, it is Antichrist, according to John. So it's important to us, one, that we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of the testimony of credible eyewitnesses, and secondly, that we are saved by a Savior who is the God-man, 100% God-man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, we are grateful that we have not believed cleverly invented tales or stories about revelations that people have had. We have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ on the credible testimony of eyewitnesses. We have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ because those eyewitnesses tell us that He is the 100% God-man, that His humanity and deity joined in one individual. He lived a perfect life in accordance with all that You said and all that You did, Father. And He died a death He did not deserve that our sins might be paid for. And then You raised Him from the dead to verify that the payment was good. We praise You for that this morning. We thank You for that. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.